Hi, my name is Yasmin Cherehi, and this is Startup Confessionals, where we interview startup founders and entrepreneurs in the Middle East and Africa. We'll learn about some of the biggest lessons these founders discovered on their journey from the personal to the professional and share how they keep themselves motivated. Today's episode is with Mukhtar El Khanchali, the founder of Portamoka. Mukhtar envisions a world where industry empowers rather than exploits, uplifts rather than represses, and he grew up between Brooklyn, San Francisco, and Yemen, and comes from an ancient lineage of farmers that traces back to when the world's first coffee was cultivated in his home province of Ib in Yemen over five centuries ago. In 2013, Mukhtar began focusing on his family's roots as coffee farmers in Yemen and seeking to reverse Yemen's nearly lost art of coffee cultivation, he founded Port of Mocha. And in 2017, his coffee was actually rated as the number one coffee in the world by the Coffee Review, which is a major accolade. His work has also been profiled in GQ, Fast Company, Vanity Fair, and New York Times, among others. The author Dave Eggers wrote a New York Times bestselling book about him called The Monk of Mocha, and it traces Mukhtar's journey as a entrepreneur and his escape from war-torn Yemen. So I am so excited to introduce Mukhtar to the show. Uh, he is a friend of mine, known him for a couple of years, and I'm just so excited that we have the privilege to have him on the show to talk about his journey. So welcome to the show, Mukhtar. Thanks so much, Jasmine. Really excited to be talking to you today. I feel like I'm talking with more of a friend than a, an interviewer. Um, so I'm pretty happy about that. Yes, yes. Well, uh, likewise, likewise. And, you know, I I think that this show and this conversation is going to be different than some of the others because it's going to be focused on consumer goods and really luxury good, which is something we have not discussed before. Um, so I'm really excited to talk to you about this particular category. And so for folks who maybe are not aware of Port of Mocha and maybe are new to you and your coffee, can you just briefly share what Port of Mocha is with our audience and also where they can find it? Absolutely. Um, for me, I, I started this journey as a Yemeni American growing up as a third culture kid trying to find my identity in this world. And uh, I really fell in love with coffee, this new third wave of coffee that was coming about um, in the 2010. And uh, what Puerto Mocha does, essentially, our goal is to try to shore the distance between coffee producers and coffee consumers. Uh, and so we currently work in Yemen and are working with a few other origins now uh, with the goal of trying to help farmers connect to these markets by being vertically integrated and getting rid of any middlemen. And then finding consumers who are looking for interest in coffees, interest in stories, and try to um, help connect them. So we're kind of at work as bridgers. Um, and so been really lucky to work with some of the best um, farmers in the world and some of the best roasters. Uh, and so you can, if you're in the Middle East, there's a few different cafes um, in Dubai. There's uh, Espresso Lab in Abu Dhabi. There's Cartel Roasters in Kuwait, Richard's Coffee, as well as Ace Coffee Roasters and a few others. If you go to our website, portofmocha.com, you can kind of see them. Um, and you, also, you can also buy directly from us on our website. We roast coffee and and we kind of work in in between roasting and, and working with other roasters. But um, it's been quite a journey trying to navigate this world, but something that I'm pretty uh, passionate and happy that I've found. Amazing. And we can also obviously purchase it in the United States, correct? And are there any other countries? Yeah, we, we sell a lot of our coffee in Asia. Uh, in the U.S., if you go on our website, Port of Mocha, spelled M-O-K-H-A, dot com, you can um, kind of see our, our different options and, and buy directly from us also. In the U.S., we've been working with some really wonderful roasters, um, folks like Blue Bottle, here in San Francisco, Equator Coffee, um, George Howell in Boston, Blendon in Texas, Intelligence in Chicago, and some really cool people. But if you visit our website, we can, you can see where our partners are and um, find someone locally, hopefully, that can brew you some of our delicious coffee. Amazing. So, Mukhtar, when was the moment you realized that you had a product market fit? And I'm just really interested in the luxury goods piece of this. Like, how did you know that you had 
uh, an audience that was interested in this type of coffee and also at your price point, right? Because I think for those who don't know, uh, at least some of your coffee is, is priced very high, right? Relative speaking. So can you talk to us about like what that was like? How did you know that there was a market for it? And why did you believe that the coffee that you were making was uh, special? And, and what did you risk also like trying to bring the coffee from Yemen over to the United States? Because I think that's a very interesting story. That is such an interesting question. And it, I could talk about that for years, but to try to <laughs> condense it, um, I wish when I started my coffee journey, which was in late 2013, that I knew what a, what product market fit meant and what an MVP was and what the convertible kind of note were. These were things that I learned later on. And, you know, going to business school is great to, to learn these things, but life can also teach you, which was with my case. So I initially went because I, I had this deep burning, I guess, desire to see this kind of coffee art or this coffee market revitalized. Yemen in the, in the 16, 1700s dominated the world coffee. Uh, it was, there was actually a city in Yemen called Mocha, a port, which I named my company after, which supplied the world's coffee. In, in 1850, it was almost 70,000 tons of coffee. And so I, I looked at the current, at that time, the current export, which was around 12,000 tons. It was such a, a huge decline. Um, and there are many reasons why that happened. And so initially, I just wanted to see how can I get this coffee trade back to where it was or and get it to the world the way it should be. Uh, this third wave of coffee was starting to come about. And when I spoke and asked people about Yemen coffee, in particular older seasoned coffee buyers from these big roasters, they would tell me that Yemen coffee, it's amazing coffee. It's just really hard to get very expensive. It's kind of this kind of unicorn coffee. Um, but oftentimes uh, it's because there's a, there's a long distance between farmers and them. A lot of uh, things happen towards the quality that diminish the quality. So uh, many, many times it's really uh, has bad defects, but they would always tell me that the best coffee they ever had was a cup of Yemen, you know, once in their life, like, you know, 10 years ago, or 20 years ago, or five years ago. So my goal was trying to replicate that one cup and I had to drop out of going, going to law school and, and go to Yemen, which was a very difficult conversation with my family. Um, as you, all of us know, you know, our families are, you really have very limited ideas of, of, of past in life. You become a, a doctor, an engineer, or a lawyer. Pretty much you have to work in those kind of bubbles. So Going back to Yemen was a very odd thing, but I just initially it was like maybe it'll be a nonprofit or some hobby. But as I got more and more in the trenches, I realized this is a this is, there's a huge problem here that could be solved. The problem I wanted to solve was more of a social impact problem than a a, a revenue problem. Um, and so I, I, I'm a firm believer in impact driven companies. I think that. The world has a lot of problems and we can all figure out what is one product or, or one um, service we can do to help alleviate something, you know? And, and I think when you have an impact driven vision, you have, um, it's, you'll, you'll face difficulties and you'll face problems, but if you're, if your ambitions are, are greater than yourself, it, it gives you, it makes you feel more driven to accomplish something and get to do those difficulties as it posed it as opposed for it to be something around just financial gains. So I started out, you know, really kind of line and, and I, and I, it's funny. I look back at the SWOT analysis I had strengths, opportunities, you know, weaknesses and threats and under like threats I had like, you know, um, airstrikes and Al Qaeda and pirates in the Red Sea and all these issues, you know, and if I had a little bit of your, business background or knowledge, you asked me, I probably would have been deterred and go in this direction because of just, you know, it just wasn't something logical. Like I didn't really know that there was a product market fit to answer your question. Um, and so I just kind of went and along the journey, I discovered, wow, Yemen has these really ancient cultivars that are very unique. And the, the, the terroir, the way it's grown, it all 
creates this perfect storm for a really interesting product. It's limited, it's rare, and it tastes objectively really, really good. Um, and so I had to build up this infrastructure on the ground and 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 go th- and learn how to how to farm and how to ferment coffee and everything along the route. It's kind of like a video game where every level was a different boss you had to deal with. You know, then you have to learn about green bean sorting and then export laws and import laws and then supply chain management and then marketing and then go to market strategy and packaging DTC versus B two B. All these things you kind of like because I was like, let me see if I can produce something. Okay, now let me figure out how to sell it. Um, and so when I got back. I got very lucky that the coffees, you know, because of the way they, um, because of the, the, the scores they had and, and when they cupped them or tasted them in these, in these, uh, uh, evaluations, they had really high, like su- extremely high scores, like abnormally high scores. And so our first customer in the U S was blue bottle. They, they, I found out, you asked me the day, it was like, I think maybe four days before they, we launched this big meeting with their, uh, their creative team and the marketing team and the PR team. <laughs> and they told me that they would charge uh, $16 for a cup of the coffee. And I just looked at them like, I got like $16. Like, why would you charge so much money? Like for, it's like my friends kind of like laugh like you do right now. And I had no idea. Like, why would you charge so much money for this coffee? And, you know, they were paying, I think per kilo at that time, most coffees were like, I don't know, $5 a kilo six dollars and i charge 134 dollars a kilo um i came up with that number based on what the farmers are being paid for in yemen which is already expensive because it mostly goes to saudi arabia and the gulf and they pay a lot of money for yemen coffee because they, the, the name and brand and even though the coffees are horrible if you ever have any you know like, Arabia, like arabic coffee it's really dark usually roasted so it hides defects they put cardamom and they put like you know ginger and zaffron and all these things so like you, you don't really know what it, it tastes like uh, by itself um as a black coffee so i i said you know what are they getting paid okay if i if you do this i told the farmer if you if you pick the coffee's red ripe you know cherries and you do it this way that way could you do that if i paid you more money and this one farmer, she said to me, well, you know, Muhtad, if you, if you paid me more money, I would pick rainbow colored cherries for you. <laughs> so like, I said, okay. So I, I just did it based off of like, what does a farmer need to get paid to live a dignified life? And then after that, I, I tried to sell it, which is a very bad idea in business. Like you need to establish like, you know, instead of trying to throw darts in, the, in, the, in blank, you know, in the sky, it's always better to talk to a, a customer and understand their, their their pains and gains and do a value you know value proposition canvas chart and figure out what they need and is there something that you know and, and reverse engineer a product for them you know um, and, and so that's not what I did. I want to actually double click on that because um, we brought up so many things and I think we could talk for hours and hours about this. Sorry, the question is, is so- just like. It's just like a big question. And I'm sorry if I took so a big much time. No, no, no. It's great. It's so fascinating. I mean, you know, I think uh, a couple of things come to mind. You know, first of all, who were the people that you were surrounding yourself with at the time who helped you? Like, was there a mentor? Did you bring people onto your team? Did you bootstrap this, uh, you know, in the beginning? Like, were you able to just kind of survive without making an income? I mean, and also it's just such a fascinating story that you're able to then have all these really highly kind of dignified uh, coffee shops uh, sell your coffee at that price, right? And, and how did you know at the time that you'd have a market for it? I know that there's so many questions packed in there, so feel free to pick one. Uh, but I'm really, really curious about all of those points. Uh, and also just what your family was going through and what they were thinking and what they were saying. Um, like what were the candid conversations that were happening? So a couple of things. So we talked partnerships. Like did you partner up with anyone? Did you bring anyone in that maybe um, – you know, had like a experience with some of the blind spots? Uh, and then also did you bootstrap? Let's just start there. <laughs> I mean, yeah, there's kind of like a, probably three phases of my company. In the first phase, it was just me with very limited, you know, business and coffee knowledge for that matter. Um, and just some uh, friends and family. And as 
I began to work in Yemen on the ground. You know, this is very important when you bring on partners, like you have to have a, a very similar, like the same vision and mission. And otherwise it becomes di- they, they, something called divergence happens where you, you kind of separate, you know? And so my vision was very different than what they wanted. They wanted the high volume, you know, a company that, you know, that did different kind of work than I wanted to do. Um, and so I had, to, after like, I separated from that company and then I incorporated in 2016, which is what I have in our company, you know, Puerto Mocha now. And at that point I got introduced to a few different people in the Silicon Valley um, who really knew about startups. And, and I was really obsessed and fascinated with startup culture. Like growing up, you're in the Bay area. It's hard not to be influenced by, by this culture of people who built great things. Um, and so when I, when I got the blue bottle deal, it gave me a lot of notoriety. And honestly, when they asked me if I wanted to co-brand when we launched with them, I had no idea what that meant. I'm like, sure, <laughs> like we can do that. I had no idea what that would, what that would mean and how that first week when we launched, we had, I think like the articles that came out was like 40 million different online impressions from different articles that came out about the coffee. And many people were like, oh God, this is crazy, like $16. Like these guys are so pretentious. Like why would someone pay that much for coffee? Then they would go and try it. And they were like, wow, it's actually really good. And none of the reviews were bad. Um, and so it really opened people's eyes to like in palates to a new world of coffee. Like this is coffee has so many different flavors and, and, and they, as, than what you're used to. Um, and so from that, I figured that, okay, I should probably, you know, I wanted to grow, raise a seed round. And uh, at that time, I didn't know much about um, the world of, of startups as much as I should have. So I brought on a good friend of mine, Ahmed Ibrahim at that time, who um, was really gifted in understanding this world. And he really understood this vision where I really wanted to recreate the 17th century coffee house that was in Istanbul and Damascus and Vienna, London. This is a space and a time where it changed the world before coffee came into Europe. The main drink was alcohol. And so when, when coffee comes in, there's a, a correlation of that. And then the industrial revolution, like in period. And, and so I really thought that coffee was as powerful fuel for human intellect and social change. Um, and so seeing what coffee shops were doing around me, I was like, you know, this is like not that same vision. Whereas like Starbucks, for example, has this kind of third space in between your work and your business where you really are paying for the, to use the space. You really see coffee from, Star, from Starbucks in people's homes. But unfortunately, the space is kind of disgusting like it's not really nice and you know it's just like not that kind of inspiring space uh and i think a lot of coffee shops now they kind of inverted where they have beautiful coffee you know but the space is no outlets there's no wi-fi it's kind of like why you in and out um so my my goal was like i wanted to go into more of a high-end i thought i believe that coffee is a high-end product and it's not as cheap commodity and and it should be experienced in high-end spaces Mission Star restaurants, high-end hotels, you know, similar to wine or, or even chocolates now. And I thought that coffee hasn't had its moments yet. So we decided to go and raise um, money. And through, through a friend of mine who I met in a cafe randomly, we were in a coffee shop, some friends, and she was there. We started talking and, and, and she joined the conversation. She actually worked at Founders Fund. In the one, one of the best venture capital firms in the world, and she's like, you know, you, you should come give a talk on my on my uh, place. And I told, <laughs> I told my, at that time, I thought she said founding fathers, and and I <laughs> and then when I, I I googled in, I found that was Founders Fund, and I learned about that firm, and it's one of the top tier tier one firms. And so we ended up meeting one of this, this amazing partner there, um, Cyan Bannister, who's just super amazing investor and believed in us. He said, yeah, you know, you guys are great. This is a great, I actually am an investor in Blue Bottle. So I've heard about you guys from before. And I think there's something here. Go find a lead investor and we, we, we will join on board because they don't do, they don't lead early stage, um, these kind of rounds. So I got very lucky, I mean, and I found, I think one of the most brilliant minds in the Middle East in startup world, Barak Fahim. 
um, from Endure Capital. I mean, most of the cool companies or like interesting companies, he, he he's behind, he's there somehow. Even companies here, like not, not just in this, here in the Silicon Valley, he's kind of his bridge between the Arab world, you know, Dubai and Palo Alto. And so he was a, 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 a my like, you know, you can say startup sheikh. Like I just learned a lot about investment structures and, and I learned a lot about um, how you go from the early stage into your series A and, and what that looks like. And, um, and so I, he was one of those very important people in my life that I'm very happy that I got to, um, interact with. And, and he's just, and just seeing him over the years grow. It's been incredible. So I, I, that was how that happened. Um, and then I guess the last part of that question was my family. I mean, yeah. I mean, when I was a kid, when I would, my parents would threaten me if I did bad in school. And they would say, if you don't do well in your studies, we're going to send you back to work on the farm in Yemen. I was like the threat. <laughs> and, uh, and that's what I do now. So they were like, you know, my, everyone has like, has heard the story of like my grandparents or, you know, or parents who risked their lives, $200 in their pockets and got to this country. And, and, and you know, they, and for me, like, for them to see me go backwards, it was, especially at a time, you know, post Arab spring and things were just not great in the part of the, that part of the world. Um, especially in Yemen, it was really alarming to them. I think they first thought it was a kind of a phase and, you know, maybe a summer thing. And then it went longer for a year then the year, two years. And so then they were just kind of like, I guess they thought I was just, I became this mountain villager living in farmers and villages you know, and just working with coffee. And I think they were probably, I don't know if they were embarrassed, but who knows? I don't know. They don't tell me these things, but <laughs> things were very weird, especially as things are very difficult. The, the war began to escalate overnight and I was stuck there. And subsequently, like I had to escape on a boat and, and, and it was a long story, but, but um, I remember the first time yesterday I, I took my mom, it was on the first day of Ramadan, 2016, the first time, any of our coffees were ever sold anywhere in the world. It was in San Francisco. Uh, Blue Ball had just released our coffee across the, the country. And, and, uh, and I took my mother with me. Um, I couldn't drink because I was, in, I was fasting, but she was, she could, um, she wasn't fasting. And we went to this coffee shop, you know, it's fancy coffee shop in Mitten Plaza, downtown San Francisco. And there's a huge line of people and there's like these reporters and, you know, and I didn't tell them I was, you know, who I was. I just kind of, like wear sunglasses and my back baseball hat. And I went in and sat down with my mother. And then there was a whole thing about like the way they sold the coffee was incredible. They had the coffee and they had a booklet with my, our story, like a map of Yemen. My family's hometown of Ib was there and my, my picture of me. And it's like a little accordion booklet. I showed my mother the booklet and she, she bought the coffee, she drank it. And, and, um, the, the barista was telling me my stories like this is this guy who works in Yemen and <laughs> I mean totally added things that weren't true like he said I, I took I like took the coffee on a boat you know and I took <laughs> I'm like it's not really scalable business but keep going and you know but it was really cool my mother really understood it the first like see you know or you know this is like what I've been doing and and then they understood it but I don't know it took a it took a you know and that's the thing I think for founders like there's gonna be a long time when you're very alone you see this thing that no one else, else sees and you can doubt yourself sometimes because everyone around you tells you something, you know, and you're, you don't, but they don't see what you see sometimes. And yes, there is a fine line between being a visionary and being delusional. <laughs> you got to have your, your advisors around you, right? You got to have your people around you who can give you the right mentorship and guidance. Um, and you need to read the data. If you do not, the people who are able to read the data and, and pivot fast and learn quickly are the ones who succeed because you don't want to keep going down a rabbit hole and take everyone around you. And it's just, you have to admit when you're wrong and, and say, you know what, this is not working. And I have, you do that all the time, but yeah, that's, you know, long story or short story long. That's what, what happened. Wow. Wow. So, um, uh, I want to, um, I just, the, the, the visual, by the way, of you sitting down with your mom, <laughs> just, makes me smile. And, uh, you know, I think it's so beautiful because I'm sure that she probably 
saw like, you know, what you actually were creating in the world. Um, and I, I think it seems like that throughout this journey, you've been very thoughtful about all the people on your path, you know, from the farmer and wanting them to have a dignified life to, you know, the, the really the story behind the actual product itself. And, and I just think it's, it's just phenomenal. Um, I, I wanted to ask how this last year, the pandemic impacted your business, you know, how did you, and how did you deal with it? How did you kind of respond to it? It was, it was quite I wouldn't even say turbulent. It was just, it was just violently turbulent. Probably a better word to say, <laughs> because we had just closed uh, a pretty significant amount of money uh, for an investment investor in, in the Middle East, actually, to begin a base in the, in the GCC to expand there and then around the world. Um, and it took us a long time to kind of figure that out. And and then at that time, I flew out our COO to go close the deal, sign the agreement. He gets there, I think March 6th, um, 2019, and the Kuwaiti government closed the airport that day. So he gets quarantined and he gets shipped back, deported. Like he spent like- I mean, tw- 2020, right? Uh, 2020, yeah, 2020. And he gets like, he gets stuck in a, like almost a de- detention center in, in, for half a day in Dubai. So it was a whole- Wow. So he comes back and that deal was, did not go through anymore. Because of the, they were just you know holding on to their capital because of the current situation. So, you know, we it's like you 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 can plan a pretty picnic, but you can't predict the weather, right? So, at that point, it was difficult because everything was changing in real time. You know, in the U.S., a a quarter of 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 roasters, the cafes, closed down. Um, like small businesses were being hit difficultly. Uh, there was a higher growth on online sales, which helped us a lot. It really did. Like being able to, the demand of coffee didn't slow down. The route just took a more digital ro- approach. Our whole pitch for that round was to do a B2B luxury expansion. And that was gone. There's no restaurants, there's no hotels. Mm. You know, so quickly having to figure out what is the game plan and how to, you know, cut expenses and, and, and to weather the storm and figure out where we wanted to be. And ultimately, a lot of good things came out of it. You know, uh, besides, like, uh, we were able to communicate with our customers more. And I think a lot of times we forget to do that. It's so vital to talk to customers and understand their journey. Their, what are they using their, your product for? How can you improve it? And there were a lot of assumptions that I had that were completely wrong about our customers. And can you give us? Can you give us one of these assumptions? I mean, <laughs> even something as the type of roast profile, right? So in the world of coffee, there's people assume coffee tastes a certain way. It's like this kind of chocolate, hazelnut, peanutty kind of flavor, with, you know, um, and, and and really, or it's very bold and very dark. Um, a lot of that has to do with the coffee and then the roast profile. So it's like when you have a really good steak. You know, if it's really cut really well, you probably want a medium, medium rare even, you know, as opposed to well done and burnt. When, and, and a lot of times, you know, uh, coffees that are defective, people just burn them and, they, and then you drink it with sugar and cream just to drink it. It hides the defects. But if you have a really amazing coffee that has like a fruit note of like berries or strawberries or some, or guava or like something really beautiful, you, you, you don't want to roast that dark. You want to keep it lighter and, and, and bring that out. But the thing is, I realized when I, I was developing this product called the Everyday Yemen for that for it to be an everyday product for people to drink. And I developed three different uh, types of coffees and I sent it out to a focus group, 12 people. And it was there, were, there was they're very fruity, very floral, like great coffees. And most of the people did not like them. They were like, it just tastes too acidic and it tastes too sweet too sweet what do you mean <laughs> so then i went you know what let me roast this thing and i roasted it very dark like almost on purpose you know and i gave people two versions a light roast which was the way it was supposed to be you know which brought out in all the beauty needs of the coffee and i roasted this darker version and this is what people said they were like lot uh coffee a which is the light roast it was sweet 
bright citrus. La, uh, B, which is a darker roast, leather, tobacco, burnt nuts, um, and dark chocolate. And then they would say, we definitely like lot B. And so I realized that for a lot of people, they just love this kind of darker, full-bodied coffee. Where I, I personally like the, you know, the lighter, fruity coffee. And so you get to a point where you, you have to understand, you know, is this a business or is it something, an idealistic, you know, you know um, philosophy you're trying to bring to the world. And so I do want to take people, I realize, they, they're going to they're gonna probably start at a certain level and you got to work the way up to get them to, you know, I guess the, the, the proper way. And sometimes they're not going to want to be, even with that education, they're, you know, they're going to, I like this kind of coffee and you have to respect that. And my goal is to help farmers get their coffee in people's hands and help people get better coffees. So, you know, it's, it, that was one of the things I had to learn, like, like uh, uh, in terms of flavor profiles. And that was like one example. Um, I hope that made sense. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, it's so, it's just interesting. I love that you're doing these focus groups too and getting feedback from customers because I think so many companies miss that point. You know, they're just, they're constantly making their own decisions without even, um, you know, incorporating the feedback. A lot of times it's like, we'll get feedback, but we won't actually implement it into our product roadmap. So, um, yeah. So, okay. So we are unfortunately coming at time, but I wanted to ask, Mukhtar, I mean, again, we could talk for hours about this and, you know, it's, it's just also, it's obvious that you're a natural marketer and a natural storyteller. Um, and so that really is very helpful when building a company and product. And so what would be your main takeaway for people that are listening, who might be interested in starting a company? What do you want to tell them? I think it's, we have a lot of problems in our world. And I think that we all can figure out one problem we can solve, either through building a product or some kind of service. And I think we need, we need to have more impact-driven companies. Like you can have a double bottom line. You don't have to just make profit. There are, other, you know, there are, there are ways to make profit and to help them, the world in some way. And so I think that uh, if anyone listens out there, look at yourself, see what those problems are and how we can you know, better do that. And then once you kind of figure that kind of problem, there's the traditional roadmap of like, you have to become an expert in that field read the books, go to the conferences, get the right mentorship. Um, and, and once you, but I, I do want to say that if you're going to take this route, it's not easy. There's a lot of grit. Like I want a friend of mine, his company just got acquired a couple of days ago for $220 million. Two years ago, he texted his brother, Hey, we don't have any money in the bank. We owe AWS $60,000. Like, People don't see that. Like they only see the, the success, but the, honestly, it's it's a lot of heartbreak, betrayal, long nights, balance sheets that are you know not great. Um, and y- if you just become a little brave, you'll win the war. You know, for that extra hour. So it's you're gonna buckle up for a very difficult road wrap and, and difficult problem, and make sure that you are have some kind of centeredness around that. If you're married, make sure your spouse knows, you know, what they're getting, what you're getting into. Uh, and there's going to be a lot of sacrifices. That's why I think that if you have an impact-driven company, even if you lose a lot of personal things, it, it, it becomes worth it because you do something that, you know, benefits humanity and it's greater than yourself. And, you know, you feel good at least you're, that you're doing something like that. That's kind of my, my um, advice just to... Find a problem and try to fix it. I love that. That's such powerful advice. Thank you for that takeaway, Mukhtar. Oh, so so nice talking to you. Um, so where can people find you if they want to learn more about Porta Mocha, they want to buy your coffee? Obviously, you shared the, uh, the places where people can purchase the coffee in the U.S. and um, in the Middle East. But uh, where where else can people find you? What's the website and resources? We are going to launch a series of storytelling events and ex- sensory experiences around the world, but mostly in the U.S., um, uh, particularly in Q1 onwards for next year. And so if you go on our website, portofmocha.com, or follow me us on Instagram, or Port of Mocha, or my personal Instagram, 
you'll hear announcements of those. Um, they should be really cool and fun experiences. And um, you can kind of, you join those kind of the, those. And we all, we tend to have a lot of interesting content that we, we, we publish. So that's probably the best way to, uh, to hear about us. But thanks so much for having me on. Thanks for so much for telling these kind of like real honest, like, you know, when I heard, you know, Star Wars Confessions, I was like, okay, this is going to be really cool. I'm sure, you know, you asked me and it doesn't surprise me that she's, she's the one behind it. And um, I hope that anything I said today was, was beneficial. Oh, very much, Bakhtar. Thank you so much for your time. I know that as a founder, you guys are so busy. So I really appreciate it. And yeah, I have a lot to think about as well after this uh, conversation. <laughs> and I'm sure that almost everyone listening will, will uh, you know, be thinking about your responses uh, as well and how they can, you know, motivate themselves to do more social impact things and, and also just kind of be in their kind of highest self. Right. Cause I think that the story of resilience that you so, you know, beautifully articulated in your story is just one that I think a lot of people shy away from. And so I think that resilience is like the key theme here. And I, I love what you've, you've put, you've uh, portrayed um, today. So thank you so much for your time and for our audience. Thanks for joining and for listening to Startup Confessionals. <laughs>